Bail and a court date have been set for the retrial of a man accused of killing a young girl in the North County. And a San Diego Eagle Scout sends back his awards, trying to send a message about a controversial scouting policy. I'm Eric Anderson. Those stories tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. And I'm Peggy Pico. Coming up in our weekly roundtable, an update on the scandals dogging a candidate for a board seat in the South Bay School District. Plus, Tony Award winner Des McEnough talks with us about his new musical at the La Jolla Playhouse. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Good evening and thanks for joining us. Dwayne Brown is off tonight. A million dollars bail has been set for a transient who's waiting to be retried in the murder of an Escondido girl. The retrial of Richard Tewitt has been scheduled for May. He was convicted once before of killing 12-year-old Stephanie Crow. The conviction was overturned on a technicality. A retired San Diego architect hopes returning to his Eagle Scout, uh, returning his Eagle Scout badge will add to the building crescendo of opposition to a long-running Boy Scout policy. This past summer, the Scouts reaffirmed their opposition to accepting openly gay members. Daniel Brogan reached the pinnacle of scouting in 1962. President John F. Kennedy signed the certificate that announced to the world that Daniel had achieved a long-standing goal in his young life to become an Eagle Scout. This was one of the key components of the steps in my life and uh, helped shaping my values. The local newspaper recorded the event with mom and dad looking on. If you look at the history, um, the people who have received this award, uh, I think it's something like 2% of scouting, but if you look at the individuals, uh, there's a lot of leadership that is brought to bear and you learn about leadership early on. Brogan says it is time to employ some of those leadership lessons. That's why he's returning the badges, sashes, and certificates. And he's including a letter saying why. He wants the scouts to know that their anti-gay policy reinforces bigotry, and there's no reason for it. You know, to take a group of kids and ostracize them in this day and age for their orientation is just wrong. It's just wrong. So my purpose here is hopefully to accelerate a change that's inevitable. It's going to happen. Brogan, who's married with grown children, is joining hundreds of other Eagle Scouts who've already returned their badges since summer. Most of these things, like every other cause, most of it has to do with timing, momentum, and the strength of support that you have for the cause. This is the time. KPBS contacted the Boy Scouts of America, and they sent us a written statement, quote, Each year, more than 50,000 young men earn the rank of Eagle Scout, totaling to over 2 million. Although we're disappointed to learn of anyone who feels compelled to return his Eagle rank, we respect their right to express an opinion. The statement continues, While a majority of our membership agrees with our policy, we fully understand and appreciate that not everyone will agree with any one position or policy, unquote. Well, Brogan says he is hopeful the Scouts will change their position, and he says if they do, he'd like to get his badges and certificates back. A measure to regulate medical marijuana in Imperial Beach is getting an endorsement from Councilman Brian Pat Bilbray. He's the son of incumbent Congressman Brian Bilbray and the brother of Brianna Bilbray, who's become an advocate for medical marijuana since undergoing treatment for melanoma. Their father has been an opponent of medical marijuana. A new poll shows growing support for a measure to repeal California's death penalty. The latest field poll shows 45% of likely voters 
favoring Proposition 34. It would replace the death penalty with life in prison with no possibility of parole. 38 percent are against it. Supporters of the measure don't yet have the majority they need for it to pass. 17 percent of those polled said they are still undecided. San Diego mayoral candidates Carl DeMaio and Bob Filner stopped taking jabs at each other just long enough to answer some questions from teens on bullying. Our Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks joins us with more on how area young people are getting involved in this year's election. Megan, how are they participating in politics this year? Teenagers and the nonprofit Social Advocates for Youth sent the mayoral candidates a questionnaire. They asked the candidates questions about bullying, teen substance abuse, and after school programs. And what are the teens going to do with that information if they can't actually cast a ballot? Well, they may not be able to vote, but they actually might have something a little better, a contract of sorts with the future mayor. The teens said they wanted to get the candidates to take a stand on youth issues and put it in writing so they could hold the candidates accountable. And you said there was an added benefit for some of the teens. Yeah, many of the teens are second generation immigrants whose parents don't speak English. So they said that now they can help educate their parents on issues before they head to the polls. We actually have all of the candidates' answers online at speakcityheights.org. KPBS Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks. A candidate for one of the two board seats in the Sweetwater Union High School District faces charges by the city district attorney's office. Peggy Pico finds out more about the troubling accusations on our weekly roundtable. The Sweetwater Union High School District has some challenges, including an indictment against one candidate for the school board and some opposition to the new superintendent, Ed Brand. Here to help sort out these accusations is Ricky Young, watchdog editor for UT San Diego. Ricky, thanks for being here. One candidate, incumbent Pearl uh, Quinones, she is under indictment by the district attorney's office for what? Well, I should first clarify, it's not an indictment, it's charges, right, because the grand jury brings indictments. I make that mistake myself. All right. Uh, but it's charges. They're felony charges. Uh, initially, they were charges of uh, accepting gifts, meals, uh, plays, Jersey Boys tickets from contractors, uh, and failing to report that. And then later, the DA brought charges of actually accepting bribes. So these are very, very serious charges uh, that have been working their way through the courts. They're, they're looking at uh, January 7th, I think, as a trial. What does she say about those charges? Well, she has uh, pled not guilty. I'm not sure exactly what her defense is, uh, but she has uh, made the case through her attorney to us that maybe there's some selective prosecution going on, that other people in the county have accepted gifts or meals and failed to report them, uh, and, and even, you know, given government money to the people who gave them those gifts, and yet all they had to do is fill out a new form and, and uh, maybe pay a little fine and move on with their life. They're not facing criminal charges. So. But that's sort of uh, everybody else is doing it so she's not denying the charges well she pled not guilty is all I can okay. tell you I mean I, okay. I I don't think she's gonna say she didn't take the meals or the Jersey Boys tickets because it's pretty clear mm -hmm. but uh, you know exactly what the legal defense is I'm honestly not sure all right well while all of this was going on she became the Grand Marshal at the Sweetwater High School's uh, homecoming parade yes how did that come about well we're not exactly sure uh, we sent a reporter Catherine Poitras who covers Chula Vista for us to try to figure that out because there was some dissatisfaction in the community, community that a criminal defendant would be the grand marshal of their uh, homecoming parade. Uh, and uh, we asked Pearl, for instance, who asked you and when did they ask you to be the grand marshal? And she, she didn't remember. Uh, you know, we, then we tried to find out through some other sources. Um, you know, the, originally Dr. Oram from the nearby uh, uh, National School District had been asked, and then he was told the ASB decided that they wanted someone else. So we went to the ASB advisor and he said, well, I got nothing to do with who the Grand Marshal is. So we're not really sure. Some external forces, maybe the district office came in right. and, and implanted her as the, the, the Grand Marshal. When you were talking about ASB, uh, Association of Student Bodies, right? That's Correct. right. Okay. Tell us about the other incumbent uh, for the other seat. What's going on there? Yeah, Bertha Lopez is her name. Uh, she's not... Uh, she's certainly not facing criminal charges, but early on, about a, a year ago, last uh, December, uh, she, she her house was raided, and, and some of her, uh, um, you know, political opponents have said that's sort of an indication of some that she's implicated in all this contracting mess. Uh, she certainly says she's not. She's been very critical of everything that went on, uh, but she's drawn a challenger. Bert Grossman is his name. He's a former San Diego Charger uh, who was named in Sports Illustrated Big Mouth because he was always very critical of his uh, 
uh, well, he was very outspoken, and he's being very outspoken in this race. He's made some choice comments about Pearl Quinones and others, um, and, uh, you know, so, but presumably with that name ID, he's, he's a pretty serious candidate. All right. Unfortunately, we are out of time. We can hear more of your interview on our website, kpbs.org. UT San Diego's Ricky Young, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. While the San Diego Unified School District is pleading with its residents this election to increase their property taxes by a few hundred dollars to pay for school repairs and upgrades, other school districts in the county are raising taxes without a public vote. Our investigations desk takes a look at this so-called voluntary tax. Joanne Ferrian has more. Across California, a law called Mela Roos allows special districts, nearly all in new developments, to charge homeowners thousands of dollars a year to build new schools, buy buses, even pay for iPads. Here's a look at one San Diego neighborhood that benefits from the extra tax dollars. About seven miles east of the coast near Black Mountain Road is a new neighborhood called Del Sur. Homes can cost up to a million dollars. The neighborhood has five swimming pools, parks, and views of the county's rolling hills. But the biggest draw here are the schools. Despite being in the city of San Diego, schools here belong to the acclaimed Poway Unified School District. The elementary school, at first glance, looks more like a country club. It's a public school. But the people who buy homes in this neighborhood pay extra taxes so their kids can attend. We love the neighborhood, love the school, and agreed it was well worth it. It's like a private education. And how much, how much do you, extra do you pay for that, though, on your taxes? You know, we haven't got a bill yet, but I think it's $700, $800, I believe. That's seven dollars or $800 a month in extra property taxes. The tax is called a Mela Roos, named after two California legislators who came up with the idea in the early 80s. It allows landowners, usually a small group of developers, to create mini governments that have the power to collect taxes from the people who buy their homes. About one in every 10 San Diego property owners pays a Mela Roos, ranging from $50 to as much as $13,000 per home per year. Some of the money pays for roads and sewer lines, but most of it pays for schools. Poway Unified collected more than $40 million in extra taxes from homeowners last year alone. Rocky Roy's son is in kindergarten at Del Sur Elementary. Roy pays more than $5,000 a year in Melarus taxes. I don't really agree with the idea that, you know, developers can just dictate what's going to happen and you know, what they're going to have here. Um, I think it should definitely should have more of a democratic uh, process and have the uh, parents involved. I News Source reporter and data specialist Kevin Crow joins me. He has been gathering and analyzing Melarus data. Now, Kevin, we're going to get to the numbers soon, but first of all, as we just heard in the story, developers get to form mini governments and charge people taxes. How does that work? Right. So developers need to build communities around the houses they want to sell. So they need things like sewers, schools, maybe some pools. And so they form these little governments and they can then issue bonds to pay for all of that new infrastructure and then they pass the cost of those bonds on to the new homeowners. Now, in California, isn't there supposed to be a two-thirds majority vote for any new tax? How come there's no public vote when it comes to Melarus? Well, there is a public vote because when those developers get together, and there's usually only a few, and sometimes there can be only one, uh, they take a public vote to essentially raise taxes on themselves and their property because they're the landowners, and then the people who move in to those land and buy the houses, they sign agreements saying that they know about the tax. Uh, but so then the tax is theirs. Like three developers take a vote? Yes. And that's considered a public vote? Correct. Okay. Now, a lot of people are affected by Melarus. I want to show some numbers to the people at home. Now, it's one in ten properties. Let's have a look. Encumbered by Melarus. One in ten. Kevin, do we know how many properties that, that, that amounts to? It's a little bit more than 100,000 properties. So. And this isn't just homeowners, right? It's business owners? No, it's homeowners, business owners, uh, commercial. So there are different fees uh, depending on the size of your house, where it's located. But, yeah. 
Okay, we heard in the story, we had an example of what people are paying. Let's look at these numbers again because I, I think this is sort of a big part of the story now. People are paying per year between $50 and $13,000 per year per home. Full disclosure here, I'm in the Poway Unified District. I have a Melarus. Mine is $800 a year. Now, is there a limit to how much people can be charged in Melarus? Well, there is, and it's there's a formula that the developers, you know, create to you know check out these taxes and establish those and so that formula already has your one percent assessed tax you know that goes to the county that's already in there your taxes typically cannot be more than two percent total okay. so all of the melrose figured into that you know it may be somewhere in the neighborhood of a half of a percent or three quarters so of a normally percent. it wouldn't be more than what your normal property tax bill is right okay so what's this money being spent on i know in the introduction to that story we heard ipads really yes ipads so typically it goes for schools like actual infrastructure, so buildings, maybe some practice fields, maybe some pools, uh, depending on where you are and what the design of the school is. But it can also be used for things like technology, school buses, iPads. Basically anything that a school can say has a life of five years. Five, five years, years or, or more. more. Now, we haven't got a lot of time left, but I know you've been working on this analysis for a long time. What about oversight? Who is keeping track of all of this money? Well, the state keeps track of some of the debt that they issue, and then the county keeps track of the taxes that they collect. But in terms of how they actually spend the money, uh, it's typically just the school boards and then concerned citizens. Okay, Kevin Crow from iNewsource, thank you so much. There's a lot more of your reporting at kpbs.org. Thank you. As we look forward to this year's election, San Diego chicken farmers are wondering about a proposition that passed four years ago. Prop 2, which required roomier cages for egg-laying hens. Simple rule, right? Well, KPBS reporter Tom Fudge says perhaps not. There are about 25,000 chickens here laying about 16,000 eggs every day. They're kept in confined quarters where the eggs roll down a runway for easy harvest. This chicken farm in Lakeside is the kind of operation that was targeted by Proposition 2. And the farmer who runs it, Frank Hilliker, is going to have to make some changes to comply with the law. The problem is he doesn't know what changes he has to make. That's the $60 million question. I wish I knew. Um, there's no regulations. Proposition 2 said just give the chickens a little more room. But how much more room? That's what nobody is sure of. Farmers literally don't know what to do because Prop 2, if people remember, it says this chicken needs to be able to spread its wings, turn around, and do natural occurring practices, you know, scratch, sit on a roost but it's not quantified at all. Vote yes on Proposition 2. Proposition 2 was overwhelmingly approved in 2008 by California voters with support from animal welfare groups who argued keeping chickens in such crowded cages was inhumane. What's missing from the proposition is any specifics about how many square feet or square inches a chicken needs to live in. California chicken farmers have until January 2015 to comply with Prop 2, Frank Hilliker says going cage-free would boost his labor costs dramatically, and it makes no sense to spend up to a million dollars for a new caging system. Until I can get some guidelines to see what I can do, what it's going to cost me, what my return on investment is going to be, I, I can't make those decisions. There has been some movement on the federal level. Senator Dianne Feinstein is backing a bill that would set minimum guidelines for commercial chicken cages nationwide, but there's no telling whether it will pass. Meanwhile, Farm Bureau Director Eric Larson's best advice for San Diego chicken farmers facing the requirements of Prop 2? I think the easy answer is you don't do anything right now. Because why would you take such a huge risk to go and make this big investment, put in all of these new cages, and they don't meet somebody's standard? KPBS reporter Tom Fudge put together that story. The president of the San Diego County Humane Society says Proposition 2 was a big victory for animal welfare, but there need to be clear standards for chicken farms in California and across the nation. A fire weather watch will go into effect on Sunday morning. The Weather Service says dry, windy conditions are expected. Here's a look at the forecast. An alternative rock band, giant robots, and a love story. Those are just a few of the elements in a new musical coming to the La Jolla Playhouse. Peggy Pico talks with its director. 
The La Jolla Playhouse has an impressive track record with rock musicals. First, there was the Broadway hit and Tony Award winners, The Who's Tommy, then Jersey Boys. Now, the man behind those hits is back in town with a new musical based on an album by the indie rock band, The Flaming Lips. Musical director and producer, Des McEnough, welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you, Peggy. First question on the books here, Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robot. Now, that's based on the music of what some have called the psychedelic indie rock band. And the Flaming yeah. Lips. Was it their music, their elaborate live shows? What was it that inspired you? You know, they asked me to do this, and they asked me to look at, uh, listen to the album, which I, I knew uh, some of the cuts from the album, and I knew a little bit of, about their, their music. But I, I basically, I put their music in the car and played it over and over. And uh, there was, you know, there's a bit of a story implied on the album, and like I'm, I'm kind of like a pencil sketch. And I just started, you know, filling it in with my imagination and eventually played them their music. I went into a studio, studio oh. in New York and remixed the music to, to you know, for the theater piece, and that, which was one of the so, weirdest experiences I've ever had in my <laughs> life. You know. uh, speaking of weird, let's take a look uh, at their performance. It's a clip of the Flaming Lips performing at Coachella in uh, 2007. Great. She's a black belt in karate Working for the city She has to discipline her body Pretty impressive, pretty animated. I've heard the same about your new musical. Tell us what the story is about without giving too much away. You know, it's it, it, it it's really a, a story that happens on more than one level. So there's the science fiction anime level, you know, where Yoshimi indeed is battling the pink robots. And it's also about a, a relationship. It's it's about uh, uh, really uh, her, this character's relationship with two two different men. And a love story, perhaps. A love story, that very much a love story, and and then also she uh, is battling an illness, and that so it's a, on that level it's a quite a serious story, but it's very magical, and I think it's tremendously uplifting. Wayne's music, The Flaming Lips, Wayne Coyne. Uh, is, uh, it's very emotional, and it's not what you would expect, I right. think. It's I've... not at all what you will expect. Really? Yeah. Did, now, did you collaborate with uh, Wayne? Yeah, we, we, uh, we, uh, we share story credit uh, on this, uh, although he wrote the lyrics and the, you know, the band wrote the music, so I, you know, they are certainly the principal creators of this and that they wrote the songs, but I was you know, Santa's little helper. You got to collaborate yeah, with them. That exactly. must have been exciting. That phrase is, I collaborate you, you collaborate me, <laughs> by collaborate. the way. You, um, actually, I have to say that um, you, you mentioned that the show was magical. And one of the things about that is that the album had robots mm -hmm. uh, yep. on it. And so does your musical, yes. Robots, mm -hmm. in a love story. So do... Do tell us about the robot. Well, you know, in, in the on the album, there's the, the, the robot unit three thousand twenty one actually falls in love with Yoshimi. That's the kind of implication, and uh, so we have all kinds of pink robots. So all we have flying robots. We have a robot that's that stands seventeen feet tall in uh, in, in in our our production. So yeah, there there are plenty of pink robots. Yeah, we were just seeing some video of that. That, and there, it seems like there's some people behind the scenes uh, who have to be quite skilled at manipulating yeah. Basil them. Basil Twist is one of the, you know, perhaps the principal puppeteer in the country. Uh, he's been uh, uh, doing the puppet work and working with Paul Tazewell, our costume designer, on on uh, the look of these things. So yeah, it's it's a magilla that there's a lot of technology in the show and. Uh, although, as I say, it's 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 the human part of the, the the show that I think is most appealing. Is that why you think it might appeal to people who don't maybe aren't fans of the Flaming Lips or who don't know know the music? Yeah, I, you know, I would say the music's very Beatlesque. They have all kinds of influences, as many bands do. But you know, I think for those of us who remember the British Invasion and. And, and love that particular music. It is reminiscent of, of, of that sound. I mean, they're very melodic, a lot of harmonies, 
Uh, they use the studio like it's a musical instrument, the way the Beatles did, and so uh, uh, that's the psychedelic so part. Yeah, it could so it could appeal to a it's lot got a, of people. I think it's got a very broad uh, appeal. I really do. Well, all right. We look forward to it. We are out of time. Tony Award-winning Des McEnough, thanks so much for talking with us. Now, Yoshimi Battles, the Pink Robots, opens at the La Polla Playhouse next Tuesday, November 6th. Thanks again. Great. Thank you. Earlier this week, we told you about UT San Diego owner Doug Manchester's plan to include a new city hall in his Navy Broadway complex. Mayoral candidate Carl DeMaio had a mixed response on whether he supports the idea. On Monday, he said no. But on Wednesday, his campaign said maybe. In response to the story, John Gordon posted this on our website. So now, let there be no doubt, Carl DeMaio is a lapdog of the old money conservative interest. On Twitter, Voice of San Diego CEO Scott Lewis wrote, Oh my, long opposed to a new city hall, Carl DeMaio is now signaling a new one on Papa Doug's lease might be good. Wow. Of the many comments to KPBS, there were none that backed DeMaio's stand, though some said they weren't surprised. On Facebook, Rami Zomiski had this sarcastic response. Carl Mimayo supports something that helps Doug Manchester, she wrote. You cannot be serious. You can weigh in on this conversation or on any other KPBS story by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. Tonight's stories are online at kpbs.org slash evening edition. And remember, turn your clock back an hour before turning in tomorrow night. We return to Standard Time at 2 a.m. on Sunday. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend.